Thanks, Joe. <laughs> okay, so since it is noon, let us start. Let me switch to myself real quick. 9 a.m. Just to be clear. 9 a.m. With with how many people we have on, it looks like we have about a hundred and you know fifty ish people on here, hundred thirty four or in counting. Um, when you come on, it would be best if you mute yourself um, so that yes. it doesn't get loud. There's going to be a, it's going to be real loud if we don't do that. Yeah, please, everybody. You should have been muted when you came on. If you have unmuted yourself, please mute yourself back on. Joe, I know you. Uh, oh, wait, here we go. Hold on. Spotlight video. Okay. Everybody see me? Okay, great. Um, first of all, I just wanted to uh, uh, hope that all of you are well and safe, your families are well during these crazy times, and I also wanted to sort of thank you all for um, taking the time today to come learn a little bit about Carpinetto. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Michael Brunts. I am a brand manager, and I have the, uh, the good fortune of getting to work with uh, Antonio, his family, and the Carpinetto Winery basically on a daily basis, uh, sometimes much to his chagrin, but he's, he's stuck with me. Um, just a couple things to, before Antonio gets started, um, we will, um, there's two ways, we're gonna, we're gonna present for 25 minutes, so Antonio's gonna run through the presentation. Um, like I said, please remain on mute if you can, so as we don't get any feedback. At the end of the portion of the, of the presentation, um, we'll have some time for questions and answers. There's two ways you can ask a question. There is a raise your hand feature that is on your screen. Simply raise your hand when we're done, I will unmute you and you can ask your question. Or if you are uncomfortable speaking, um, don't wanna speak, you can also um, hit the chat, which is in the uh, black bar at the bottom right of your screen. Simply type in your question and we'll, uh, we will uh, ask Antonio and we can go over it there. If for whatever reason, since we are on somewhat of a time uh, crunch, we don't get to your questions, send them to either myself or your direct contact at Opeachy Wines, and we will make sure that Antonio gets uh, back to you with, uh, with an answer. So with that being said, um, Antonio, take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, it's, uh, of course, uh, an honor to uh, be here with uh, 140 people. I've uh, uh, seen the names uh, of many of you, and I recognize uh, almost all of them which means uh, uh, I am in good company with my American family. Uh, of course, uh, you know, we've been with OPG uh, 30 years, and uh, it's uh, obvious that uh, we would know uh, many, many of, uh, of uh, you guys. <coughs> so uh, anyway, so the presentation is on uh, Carpineto, and uh, we're going to run through it, as Mike said, for uh, 20 minutes or so, and then uh, we open for questions. I just want you to know I'm really good with easy questions, okay? So please uh, remember that uh, information. So anyway, so uh, Carpineto is uh, a family-run operation that was started in 1967. Uh, it was started in a time when agriculture was very primitive. And, uh, and so, you know, we were just coming out of World War II and, uh, you know, sharecropping was still happening. It was a difficult time. And we were, uh, however, innovators. And so we were one of the first to buy a Fiat tractor. Imagine that. Uh, and unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. And then my father, who in uh, 1967 had this goal. They wanted to make really special red wine in a time when uh, Chianti used to come in a fiasco bottle. Uh, and so they uh, wanted to do, the, they wanted to go beyond making candle holder wines. They wanted to make really special bottles of wine. And so that's the reason why Carpinetto was founded uh, back then. By acquiring a little piece of dirt from the church, which uh, at the time uh, was uh, very cheap. I mean, all of Tuscany was very cheap. Uh, and, you know, the, my father always says that for the price of an Alfa Romeo, not a Ferrari, an Alfa Romeo, you could buy 100 acres and a castle on top. But then, of course, you would have to spend a lot of money fixing it because uh, uh, it was cheap because everything was run down back then. And so since we only had the, the price of a little Fiat, we started with only uh, 12 hectares, which is somewhere around 30 acres and a, 
rundown uh, house. This is the new generation. Uh, from the left, it's my sister Francesca. She works uh, in the office. <coughs> and uh, uh, the, uh, then it's Caterina Saket. She's holding a bottle of Brunello, uh, which just got 95 points. I'm the tallest guy there, so I'm holding two bottles. And then uh, we have uh, uh, Elisabetta, who uh, works also in the office. So this is the, you can say, the new generation of uh, Carpineto. Uh, although uh, Anton, since I'm the oldest, I also have the oldest son. And so Anton is uh, 21 and legally able to drink now. Uh, he uh, is um, also joined the, uh, joined the winery. So this is uh, the, the staff. Uh, and, uh, you know, we uh, uh, work uh, by selling wine <clears throat> now to 70 countries around the world. We're very proud of that. Also uh, proud of the fact that we sell wine, I think it's in every state now, right, Mike? Um, even uh, Alaska and North Dakota and some of those uh, uh, last uh, bastions that we hadn't yet conquered. You know, at least with a case of Togayolo, my God, you know, everybody needs a little of that. Uh, so we sell to 70 countries around the world. Eh? And uh, we run about 400 acres of our own vineyards, but then we're actually control freaks. And so we actually will, uh, since buying land is difficult in Tuscany, we uh, rent, have long-term rental agreements with a couple of hundred more acres uh, spread around, uh, 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 around Tuscany. It's where actually our tractors can drive to and we can actually run the vineyard. Uh, we run, we do about 300,000 cases a year, which makes us, uh, I would say, a medium-sized uh, winery in, uh, in Italy. Uh, but in the grand scheme of things, we are, uh, uh, you know, uh, just Ernest and Giulio Gallo, they produce 300,000 cases by lunchtime on January 1st, just so you have a little comparison of uh, the size. <clears throat> Nevertheless, we know every bottle by name, and so that makes a big difference. Uh, we, uh, uh, in total, have uh, 1,200 acres, and uh, we were founded right where you see the, the wine glass, right there. Dudda is uh, in the pink area, uh, is uh, the pink area is Canti Glassico, and we were founded there um, in 67. So we have another estate uh, just nearby, and then we have another estate in the bottom right. It's uh, in the Vino Nobile di Montepulciano appellation. And then we have an estate in Montalcino. And then also on the coast in Maremma. Uh, in total, we make 30 different wines, but they're all terroir driven. They all have a real meaning, uh, a reason for being, uh, you know, uh, that's why they're made. And, uh, and terroir is, uh, is the key. You can only be as good as your, uh, uh, your soil. Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, this is a, a representation, an actual sample of uh, the various soils we have on all the estates. Uh, and uh, there are some similarities. For example, the soil in Dudda, which is Greve in Chianti, it's Galestro, which uh, essentially is a clay schist from the Eocene, which is about 15 million years ago. It's a very rocky, with a very little topsoil. It's a very arid, uh, uh, well-draining, you know, making wines that are very elegant and smooth and silky. Um, and uh, it has a, a similarity also with the, 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 with the soil in Montalcino, which is also Galestro, and also with the soil in Gaville. So the upper left, bottom left and top right are all from the Eocene era, but of course they're grown in different areas, uh, and so therefore the climate has an, a big influence on it. On the bottom uh, right, we have the soil of Monte Bulciano, and that is a sedimentary soil from the Pliocene, uh, which uh, is actually uh, from uh, five million years ago. And you can see it's clay, and at the bottom, uh, of which is particular because it is, uh, has a particular mineral component uh, profile there that uh, makes uh, very, very interesting, uh, interesting wines. On the bottom is Gavorrano, and that's uh, on the Maremma, and that is, uh, of course, uh, a sedimentary, uh, also marine-influenced uh, uh, soil. 
and the metal it is a, a, a plate of a seafood plate uh, that uh, we have found in our vineyards of Vino Nobile and it's full of clams and uh, scallops and uh, other uh, uh, sea creatures that have been in the soil for uh, five million years. <clears throat> so first now we're going to go and explore a little bit uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, places so that we can uh, um, you know talk about them. So the first place we go to is Gaville which is right on the edge of the Anticlassico and uh, it is where uh, of course, there is a beautiful olive orchard there, so we make olive oil, and everybody know, that knows me knows that uh, we are so proud of our olive oil, and we'll take, uh, you know, of course, uh, plenty of advice on mine, but on olive oil, just like any Tuscan family, we, uh, for sure, uh, make the best olive oil in the world, and there's no question about that. Uh, but nevertheless, so we make olive oil here, and then we, it's where we started experimentation with super Tuscans back in the 70s. We planted Chardonnay, we planted uh, uh, Cabernet, you know, was uh, perfect right out of the gate with some fine tuning Chardonnay. We had some difficulties with especially learning how to barrel ferment and things like that. Um, and also, you know, malolactic, not sugar levels, etc. And so we on black, we never got right. And so we made uh, a grappa from it uh, straight, you know, so it's a story of success and failure uh, until we moved uh, the Sauvignon Blanc down to Bironobile and we found a place there to, uh, to make a great Sauvignon Blanc, which goes into the Rayolo Bianco. But essentially, this is a beautiful estate that is uh, built over an old Etruscan settlement. Uh, the building on the bottom, we have a, an olive press there. And then uh, all of the other buildings are all uh, barrel storage and, uh, and uh, wood aging, and also bottle storage. And it's a hilltop estate at around, uh, let's see, 1,200 feet with excellent ventilation. So therefore, we never have any issues with the punch rot or anything. It's uh, really a good place. Uh, it was a great place to experiment with uh, uh, these international varietals. Uh, so we were lucky in that respect. Now we go to Chianti uh, Classico, uh, to Duda, this little, uh, you know, it's uh, 12 houses, 50 people live there, plus the, plus the, uh, the priest, and that's uh, the extent of that. Uh, we, uh, when we bought the estate, there was a little shack there, and then uh, we, uh, over the years, built the winery to the right, and uh, the offices are in the bottom there, and then on the upper floors, is where the second family uh, lives. So, uh, and Elisabetta, and, uh, and uh, uh, their grandma, Eugenia, still, uh, still uh, lives there. Uh, it is one of the coolest terroirs in Chianti Classico, meaning that temperature excursions between night and day here are uh, quite, uh, quite, quite ample. Uh, so even in the warmest days, you still need a jacket at night because we are towards the bottom of the valley, but we're still at you know, 1,200 feet, but towards the bottom of the valley, surrounded by mountains, the cold air actually flows down and maintains everything uh, cool and perfectly uh, uh, ventilated. <coughs> of course, uh, here we make Antiglacio. This was our first wine, uh, not surprisingly. And uh, then, of course, we also make a Chianti Classico reserve from these vineyards, and you're familiar also with the Chianti Classico Gran Selezione that uh, we, have, uh, we have released uh, about a year ago um, from a single vineyard there. Uh, now we go to Maremma, and in Maremma, uh, on the coastline, we don't have a lot of vineyards. We only have about 30 acres. Uh, it is uh, mostly woods and olive groves, and then those large oaks you see there are actually cork, basically um, they are all over the Mediterranean and uh, including in Maremma. So we do sell the cork to a cork manufacturer, but it, uh, it is not the cork that we use for our bottles because the cork we sell them is not, uh, is not of good cork, uh, wine cork quality. But nevertheless, we contribute to the cork world. Uh, so we can say we're cork dorks as well. Uh, anyways, on the ridge we have uh, olive uh, trees and then behind, behind, uh, behind there is uh, a big uh, forest of uh, oak 
uh, that also houses uh, some animals like uh, some pigs that are uh, free range in there. Uh, we grow two things. Well, we grow more, but the two things we want to talk about, the other ones we haven't uh, really done so well uh, yet, uh, is Vermentino, which of course is a, is a, a Mediterranean grape. It's a beautiful white wine that uh, comes from here. And Merlot, which uh, of course is uh, a grape variety that does uh, perfectly on the coast with the marine influence. Uh, it gets really beautiful ripeness and complexity. Uh, is a magnificent uh, bottle of wine. So that's, uh, that's Maremma. Now we go to uh, Montalcino, and in Montalcino, <coughs> we are in uh, a special place. This is a view of the estate from Montalcino itself, directly west. So uh, we're, we're about the same height of the town, so 1,500 feet of uh, elevation. And it is uh, 30 acres surrounded by these thick woods. And in fact, it is called Forteto del Drago the fortress of the dragon. And uh, it's because uh, there is a legend there that uh, basically uh, says that there was a dragon living in these woods, uh, which uh, of course wasn't really a dragon as it turns out, it was more of a porcupine, very large porcupine, but I guess after a few bottles of Brunello, it must have looked very large and mean. And so therefore the locals have uh, uh, called this place Forteto del Drago. So at 500 meters, with a northerly exposure, we are actually a vineyard uh, that is picked in the entire Appalachian. And uh, um, we're making very silky, very elegant, very minerally um, uh, wines. And you, you, you remember from the soil, it's galestro, so it's, uh, it's this uh, uh, clay schist that uh, is very, um, not very generous soil, so the roots really have to dig deep for nutrients. And we're making just very spectacular wines that uh, actually have a very, very long aging ability. And so here's another view of uh, this estate. We also make a rosso there, which uh, you, of course, you sell, and we thank you for that. We also have an olive oil grove, olive grove, of course, and uh, th again, this is another building from the 1700s, and the cellars are below this uh, building here. And uh, in January 2021, we'll be releasing the Reserva, Brunello di Montalcino. That's uh, uh, sort of a, a news that, uh, and uh, it, the wine has been bottled, and I can, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to brag, but this is a pretty damn good bottle of wine, but in eight, nine, 10 months, it'll be even better, of course. Then we go to Montepulciano. Montepulciano is uh, where we have the biggest of our land holdings. And uh, it is also the place where we have the largest contiguous high density vineyard in Italy. Look at this sea of grapes. Uh, they're all planted up to 3,600 vines per acre. Most of it is dry farmed. And uh, the production averages uh, just under one bottle per vine, imagine. Uh, here's another view. Actually, now we're sitting on, on top of Poggio Sant'Enrico, looking south, and the mountain you see down in the distance is a volcano. So we have a mix of volcanic, but mostly sedimentary soil here with clay, in particular this blue clay that has this uh, particular uh, character of uh, making really powerful, intense, delicious wines. A new winery was built uh, about six years ago. It's got solar panels on there, 150 kilowatts. So it is, uh, of course, uh, um, built with all the latest uh, technologies to save on uh, energy, uh, very green, uh, et cetera. Uh, of course, Vino Nobile comes from, uh, from this vineyard. We're looking here at a vineyard that was planted in the uh, late 60s. And uh, it's uh, the basis uh, for uh, you know, the Vino Nobile because uh, it really you know, even though the vineyard is old and doesn't produce a lot, but uh, it makes a really spectacular product, which uh, you guys all know. And we, here we also have an old aging cellar from, again, from the 1700s, uh, where uh, the Vino Nobile spends anywhere between two and three years of, uh, of its life uh, before being bottled. Uh, from uh, this estate, 
This is the single vineyard where the Dogaiolo Bianco comes from, and that is uh, Chardonnay, Sauvignon, and uh, Grechetto, which is a native grape. Chardonnay brings in uh, uh, body, Sauvignon, that we finally got right. We don't distill this one anymore. Uh, is um, you know, brings in nice aromatics, and the Grechetto, of course, brings in the mineral character. Dogaiolo, Rosato, it's Sangiovese, and uh, that's easily explained, and it's a very popular wine. Uh, and then we have the Dogaiolo Rosso, of course, a lot of the wine come from here, but also pieces come from Arema and also from, uh, from Chianti Glacio. And uh, then we have Farnito Cab, one of the original Super Tuscans uh, from this, uh, this is the highest density vineyard on the entire uh, estate, and it comes from right here. And then we have uh, a selection of single vineyard wines that you all know, Molin Vecchio, Sant'Enrico, Sant'Ercolano, La Fornace, etc., etc. And many of these are small productions, anywhere between 10,000 down to two, 3,000 uh, bottles, because here, only released on five-star vintages, we go and find the filet mignon of the vineyard and make a small little batch fermented in cement tanks using indigenous yeast and then spend one year in brand new barrels and then five years of bottle age. So it's uh, quite uh, a slow process, but it has its uh, rewards. When making philosophy, it's uh, very simple. You know, Sangiovese, we do have a love affair with Cabernet and Sauvignon and all of that, but Sangiovese is our love and uh, respect the terroir means that when we make appellation wines, even though the appellation laws have been relaxed to allow the inclusion of uh, non-indigenous grape varieties, we only use Sangiovese, Canaiolo, Colorino, you know, the, the native grapes in our appellation wines. Well, of course, Brunello has to be 100% Sangiovese, and we're happy with that. Uh, you know, we, our wines are spontaneously stabilized. We don't use any uh, fish, uh, gelatin, no animal proteins whatsoever. So we are uh, actually a vegan friendly winery. Now, we are not that friendly to vegans because we eat them here, but uh, nevertheless, uh, our wines are able to be drunk uh, without any problems by, by the vegan uh, world. And uh, then we are very proud to be a carbon neutral winery. So uh, every one of our estates is equipped uh, sellers is equipped with solar panel systems. We believe strongly in uh, um, you know renewable energy, and then of course we've been working hard to lighten up our glass. So our glass has gone from uh, 420 grams down to 360 on Dogaiolo, for example, and our reserves have also been uh, lightened by 20 percent. And that is because the wine doesn't care how heavy the glass it comes in. Uh, and uh, why should we then exaggerate? And uh, so that uh, lightening of uh, the uh, glass, plus essentially the situation where we make our own energy and we have a lot of wood and look how many vines we got with uh, an enormous uh, surface of leaves, we absorb 20%, 26% more CO2 than we actually emit into the atmosphere and that is something we are uh, we've worked hard to become and something we're uh, uh, very proud of uh, on and something that we can improve on and we're working on that too uh, so that's our sustainability summary i will spare you all the details there uh, but i just said some of them and uh, a little bit about Aquiles. i got one minute and uh, these are, are just some some, uh, some of the latest reviews uh, i mean the basic deal is this if you're looking to drink 90 point wines, we have those. Uh, but if you're looking to drink a great bottle of wine at a good price, you know, I think uh, we can uh, uh, provide th that as well. Uh, look at Brunello got a good score. But at the end of the day, we are not a one, do a one pony show. Basically, we don't have one wine that gets 90 points and then all the other wines uh, are uh, forgotten. Uh, every one of our estates uh, is there and has a meaning. It was purchased by our founding fathers because that place has a sense of place. There is a reason why that estate has been
but because our founding fathers were and are, because my father is 76 and I'm still running strong, great hunters of terroir. You can only be as good as your dirt. And, uh, you know, we come from a farming background, even though I'm gold on all the airlines now, but we love, you know, we love dirt. And uh, this is where, uh, how wine is made. It comes from, from that. And, uh, and I, I, I added this in, Mike, because uh, we're proud also of the fact that um, not only our top wines, and we have many, get 90 points, but when you get a best buy on uh, your entry level wine, that is the biggest um, pride that you can have because it means that, you know, God permitting. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, uh, that's all I have, and uh, I'm ready for easy questions. So, if anybody has any questions, first, uh, thank you, Antonio. That was terrific, as always. Um, if anybody has a question, you can either type it in the chat right now or you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. Antonio, it's Sean. We're all speechless. Oh, that, exactly. <laughs> Mike, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Sean. Yeah, so Antonio, can you just talk about Sangiovese and a little bit about, you know, you, you talked about the single vineyard wines aging for at least five years in bottle before um, being released, but can you talk about the ageability of Sangiovese? I think it gets overlooked as a, a wine that can age, and it, we know it ages so incredibly beautifully. So maybe you could share. Yeah, that. so, so Sangiovese, Sean, thank you for the question. Sangiovese is one of the great, awesome variety, great varieties in the world. It's a noble grape variety. And uh, it is a great variety that uh, uh, really um, has uh, such a diversity and, uh, and therefore it's so difficult uh, to tame, to understand, to master. But uh, we've come a long ways in Tuscany from uh, the days that Sangiovese used to come in the straw covered bottle, you know, in the candle holder. Once you crop it to, uh, you know, uh, one bottle per vine, maybe one and a half, um, and uh, you, pro you, you do all the right things in the vineyards. Well, I mean, it is uh, a magnificent bottle of wine that is also a chameleon because it really takes on the, uh, uh, what should you say, the personality of the place. So you can have on the same estate, three different wines that come from three neighboring vineyards because their position is different, the soil is slightly different, because uh, you know, the coolness of the night is a little different. And that shows at the end of the day in the bottle uh, greatly. But Sangiovese is also a wine, so it's not, a wine that is uh, uh, a big bodied wine. It's an elegant wine. Generally speaking, it's a medium bodied wine that has these beautiful perfumes, cherries, currants, violets, and uh, also this uh, long, uh, silky tannin structure, but also a bright acidity. You know, uh, for example, us, we, uh, we typically run five to five and a half uh, grams of uh, acidity. In, in the wines, which is a fresh acidity that helps in the aging uh, process. So when you're making Sangiovese, especially from the classic regions of Tuscany, Chianti Classico, Vino Nobile, Brunello, well, uh, you're making wines from where, you know, from the uh, right place. And uh, therefore you're making wine that can age for, I mean, many of you have been to my uh, vertical tastings um, they, uh, some of our, we have uh, wines in our library that goes back to the 80s. And uh, yeah, they're not very dark in color anymore. They are a very pale uh, uh, red with some brick uh, use, but uh, the texture goes from uh, elegant to just silky smooth. And uh, the acidity is still there. Uh, the length on the palate is magnificent. It's, uh, I mean, it's a wine to fall in love with, really. It's a, it, it gives meaning to our life. 
Um, uh, there's another question here, um, Antonio from Sylvain. Uh, it says, can Antonio touch on the use of drones in his vineyards? So uh, the, the drones, uh, at the moment, we don't use them uh, because, uh, well, I mean, we use them just for making videos. But, but what we do have, we have uh, our tractors are uh, actually uh, GPS controlled. So uh, on those high density vineyards, we actually have uh, a series of uh, these uh, over the row uh, tractors that work uh, with the GPS technology. So basically what we do is uh, we walk through the vineyards and take so uh, samples of soil, we take samples of the leaves during the growing season and then understand what are the deficiencies uh, that may be uh, uh, happening in, uh, in a particular part of the vineyard. And then as we go up and down, uh, you know, um, uh, with the treatments, we will actually put on what is necessary right in that spot. That's part of the precision agriculture that, uh, that we run nowadays. You know, I, uh, I've been, I was born in the vineyard and one of my greatest uh, um, achievements as a kid was learning how to drive a tractor. I was so proud. And so it would be my great pride to go and, uh, and put the sulfur on the, uh, uh, on the vines. But back then in the 70s, our philosophy was different than today. Today, with the GPS technology and, and all of that, we just put the right amount of what's needed, only where it's needed, only when it's needed. So we have spies you know, in the vineyards, which are our meteo stations. We have uh, uh, sounds that go into the soil at different uh, places and measure moisture, measure uh, temperatures, dew points, I mean, all kinds of stuff. But back in those days, we put 50 grams, uh, you know, of, uh, of uh, zolfo, sulfur. Well, since I love my vineyard so much, I put 100. I figured more was better. And, you know, and so, we, we have gone from the Paleozoic era, you know, to the landing of the moon here in the vineyards nowadays. Uh, so that is, uh, of course, uh, something we're using uh, totally. I mean, and it's, uh, and it's something that has to do with uh, GPS technology, only that we're not using the drone. Um, but, I mean, uh, we're using that same concept for sure. Um, okay, uh, George has a question. It says, what effects does the cooler climate of Duda offer stylistically to the Sangiovese grapes? Well, um, one of the things that uh, the founding fathers have been uh, uh, very good at, uh, all the way from the 90s, because 90, 1990 was the first hot vintage that sort of uh, year where we went from the old way cool uh, to more of the modern way, you know, warmer uh, climate. And uh, the founding fathers have been smart in looking for cooler terroirs. So, for example, in Montalcino, we're probably the coolest terroir in Montalcino. In Greve and Chianti, back in 67, we were just lucky, to be honest with you to find a cool, a cool place. But in Monte Bulciano, we are in a place that is very ventilated and we are very good now. We're actually planting uh, on the north slopes of hillsides. Uh, we're planting a, a new vineyard we just planted this winter. I don't know if you've seen our, our video on, this, on our socials. We just planted a, a vineyard in the middle of the woods. You know, it's a very long, snaky uh, uh, vineyard that is surrounded by trees, so it's very cool. But Sangiovese, certainly when it's planted in a cool area, well, it maintains its bright acidity and it tends to maintain the beautiful red fruits that Sangiovese is so known for, you know, the cherries, the currants, the floral components. As, as you plant it in a warmer areas, it loses the acidity. Tannins become bigger, for sure, uh, but you lose that elegance. And, uh, and so we have always uh, uh, loved the elegance, uh, the elegant side of San Giovese and, always had, and have always gone uh, hunting for that, uh, for that part. Um, 
Good. Uh, so a question from Jeff. Uh, why did you decide to make a Gran Selezione? Well, a Gran Selezione, well, the easy answer is because we can. Uh, and, and it's always uh, and it's always something that right uh, just to play in that league. I mean, the, the reality is this: our Cante Classico Deserva. I mean, look, uh, we are still selling 2015, moving on to 2016. So you've been getting a wine that's five years old, basically uh, four to five years old. Which uh, uh, so we exceed all the aging uh, requirements of Cante Classico Reserva to the point that our wine could have been uh, a, a, a Gran Selezione. We decided to make a Gran Selezione and make it part of our single vineyard series because on our Cante Classico estate, we really have a special little spot. It's this galestro, uh, you know, this uh, uh, clay uh, schist, uh, southerly exposure, uh, but good ventilation, as we said, good uh, uh, day and night excursions. And so we just had the ability to make five, six, seven, eight thousand bottles of, depending on the year, of, uh, of this wine. And to showcase just that one spot, which is uh, just uh, a spectacular little spot. While the other, you know, of course, uh, can't think as a reserve of all our top, uh, our top vineyards. But this one, since we had a superstar, well, we decided to give it its own identity, and uh, it's proven to, uh, to be a good idea at the end of the day. But we had to wait a few years, because when you get a great idea in the wine world, uh, you have to first plant the vineyards, and then you're waiting around five, six, seven years before it's mature, it matures. And then you, when you're making wines like us, that uh, we like to uh, redo, uh, pro, uh, release them when they begin to be ready, well, then you're waiting another four or five years. So uh, in this case, we had a hunch that, uh, well, not a hunch, we knew because we pick each vineyard separately and we know when uh, we have a superstar by uh, tasting the barrels, by tasting you know, uh, the tanks throughout, uh, through, throughout the life of the, of the wine. So we, we, uh, we did it because uh, we, we thought we had a winner. And I hope, uh, I hope you agree. <laughs> we do. We do. Um, well, uh, so we're, we're running short on time. So I know there's other questions. Um, I promise you we'll get you those answers. Um, Amy, I see your hands raised, um, but we, uh, there's another meeting coming up shortly. So we're going to have to cut this off now. Um, I want to first thank Antonio, of course, for doing this uh, presentation. He was uh, magnificent as always. Very candid, very funny. So that's always good. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming on. We had over 200 people on this call. So that was great. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you all again for coming. Um, Antonio, any parting words? I thank you uh, guys um, for uh, a great uh, relationship that's uh, over 30 years uh, uh, old. And I also thank my son for uh, giving me the technical support because I'm going with tractors but not with computers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Grazie for organizing this. No, of course, of course. Thank you, everybody. Um, have a great day. Enjoy your weekends and uh, be safe, please. Ciao. Ciao.